All right, in our last session, we were discussing, um, we were actually discussing some uh, realities of the Lamb, and we had based that on um, Exodus 29, verse 38. Now, what I would like to read verse 39, 38 through 39, and then also verse 42. <coughs> Exodus 29, 38, 39, 42. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar. I mean, I just love that. It's so good. I mean, it's not, it's not simple. It's just so incredibly God talking to us. Two lambs of the first year day by day continually. That's what I want. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. In other words, all this is at the door of where God's house is, where he's located, before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak there unto you. Okay. So this is the place that God wants to meet. He wants to speak to us. Um, let's see, how did I write this? This is the place where God wants to meet, and this is the subject he wants to talk about, which was the, the offering of lamb continually day by day, in the morning and in the evening, and this is where I want to meet with you, and this is what I want to talk about. Um, any other place or conversation is not communion. It's one-sided. Okay. Now, that's important. I mean, it really is. It's not just a small thing. That's important because we talk to God about so much junk. And I'm not talking about our spiritual prayers during church services. I'm talking about the general stuff that we present to God if we even spend any time talking to him. <clears throat> and, you know, somebody said once, well, I'm not really a prayer person. I think that was me. Um, and I'm serious, you know. <clears throat> but he said... I want you to meet me there. I want you to meet me at, because you know where there is, don't you? You know where the door is, don't you? It's the, the brazen altar is right there. That's the place. That's where he wants to talk, and he wants to, he wants to do it in relationship to the temple. That'd be us, okay? <clears throat> and he wants us to commune with him uh, in the altar, in the sacrifice or the offering because um, really it's a sacrifice to the lamb not to the person <laughs> you know I mean we offer him but it's a sacrifice to him not to us but we are supposed to offer the one who willingly will give himself and we're supposed to offer him to God and God wants to meet and he wants to talk about that. <clears throat> and um, so we say, well, okay, well, I'll only do that when I get to the door of the church. We are the church. We are the temple. When you're getting up in the morning, which reminds me, I want one of those. So may I please, before... Before we leave, I'd, I'd love that. That's really wonderful. And it is what I was talking about last class and this class. It, it came, it came from. But it's not, it's not mine. It's not mine. Anything that I say in these Thursday night things is not mine. And it's not me. And it's not what I want communicated anything of an authority or anything of someone that has seen something except as the Holy Spirit says, say this. And in the same moment, I pray and say, work that in me. Yes, 
make that in me, fill me with that spirit. And, and don't want to leave that. I don't want to leave that. And I don't want to leave that with distractions of, of things that, you know, um, aren't going in that direction. Not that the church isn't, that's not what I meant, but things that come up regularly, issues and things that can pull me away from my first love. You know, and then I go for months or years without loving him in the way that he, you know, in this, in the way he wants to be loved and honored. And, you know, I do this in church, but then I don't do this outside, you know, the gathering or something. <clears throat> All right. So, um, and... Lindsay, I guess we'll call this the progression from altar to altar. <clears throat> We've discussed the fact that the fire came down on the altar, on the brazen altar, uh, but that fire, that actual first fire, the first one, lives on forever throughout all generations and is taken also to the altar of incense with the coals and lights the altar of incense. So. I'll just read so I get, because I cannot believe how little I covered last time. But in God's order, his fire first descended. This is the first thing. It first descended and consumed the offering on the brazen altar. Then coals were taken from it and set upon the altar of incense. This flame set them on fire, which caused the fragrance to ascend. In God's order, his fire first descended. Then in the end, he, it's uh, the flame set on fire, which caused the fragrance to ascend. Remember, he who ascended first descended and was consumed at Calvary. Do we automatically see the connection between the two altars in these verses? And I'm, I'm talking about Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. So I'll read that. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. But unto every one of us is given grace, but it's according, and the word but in there, but according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. There's a victorious beauty going on here where people are getting free and people are gaining gifts and whatever. <clears throat> next verse or next part of that verse, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Okay, so it is saying that there has to be a descent first before there can be any glory before, before we open our mouths, and this is Isaiah 6, folks. This is the altar of incense, Isaiah 6. Before we open our mouths, the coals should have been set on fire. You check it out. Because he's talking about wretched man that I am, but he says, you know, he's talking about what he speaks. And... We speak fragrances without coals, and there's not true fragrances. And it's, it's, it's life-changing for Isaiah the prophet, because everything up before chapter 6, chapter 1 through 5, I'm telling you, he's just rough. He just just mean-spirited almost, you know what I mean? You could say that. I mean, everybody loves Isaiah, you know what I mean? Oh, is Isaiah the sweet, sweetest prophet of them all or whatever. But I tell you what, if those, that would have continued to just rake you over the coals instead of the coals, see? And, and that's what happened. See, he was raking people over the coals <laughs> instead of letting the coals burn up his tongue so that a fragrance of Christ would begin to ascend. There has to be that fire first that descends upon.
upon the sacrifice. And if it didn't, then we may have touches of it here and there and whatever, but the, the basic uh, presentation isn't from death in him to resurrection of him as the sweet incense to God. Um, so the rest of the verse says, uh, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And here, this next part, this last sentence here is very important. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. All right, well, you know, uh, what? You know, you can see that a million ways. It's saying that the one that the fire fell on, the one that was crucified, the one that was the burned up offering, that's the same one that ascended. It's not he turned into a new, healed, glorious king, you know, but rather he's still a slain lamb, slaughtered lamb sitting on a throne. And he's still the same in spirit. And anything joined to him is still the same in spirit. This is the new birth. This is a break with the first birth. This is the reality of, of the new covenant. This is. This is. That new covenant didn't say, and, I'll, and I will build churches and we will pray and we'll do this and we'll do that. It only talks about a new spirit coming in you. Well, it is. That's, that's the basis of the new covenant. <laughs> you, know? you know? And we make it everything. And we, see, we're so cluttered with religion that we can't even see the simplicity of the truth that's in Jesus. Because we're all bound up, you know, and all this stuff does bind us up. You know, religion is, is it'll bind you up. And it's hard to break three, free from that because... Uh, you know, right and wrong, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all this kind of stuff instead of Jesus. I want Jesus. I just want you. And however my ministry goes or my outward life goes, may I get to you. But we go, oh, no, i got to protect my ministry. i got to protect my outward life so that everybody thinks, you know, got it. Let them... Let them stink, I mean think, what they want. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. See? But we get all upset. Somebody thought this of me, or somebody did this to me, or da-da-da-da. You know what? That doesn't matter to God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to God. I'm sorry. This is my opinion, and you don't have to like it. <laughs> so hold fast to your thoughts on whatever. I, whatever I say. It doesn't matter to God. The only thing that matters is his son, and that son he wants formed in you. And when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to just wah-wah to him about everything that you don't like or didn't like or whatever. You're gonna, your mouth is going to be shut. And he's going to say, I was looking for my son. I gave you the seed, and I expected more. And you went and hid it and, and played religion. Amen? amen. Well, you know, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say amen and look at you, <laughs> because I'm, I may be forcing you to agree with something you don't agree with. But I'm telling you. You know, we used, the last class, we used Matthew 25 and, uh, you know, what nation are you of, what birth are you of, what family are you of, what spirit are you of, what, this is, this is what matters to him. Let us make man in our own image. Christ is the image of the invisible God. The Messiah is the crucified, is the image of the invisible God. So, in light of Ephesians 4, 7, thank you. <laughs> you know, Kelly's back there with the, the, the things that are showing me how much time I've got. She's like a 
like a cheerleader. She's telling me you got almost no time, but it, she's like going like this, go! <laughs> and I'm going, this is, you know, this is not working together. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to read this part then. The fire that ascended at the altar of incense is the same fire that first ascended on the brazen altar to burn up the sacrifice. He that ascended is he that first descended. Okay? So, so okay, now what, what are we talking about now? We're talking about an actual reality of the altar of incense and that we're supposed to see it in Christ first before we see it in us. And that we're supposed to see the fulfillment of what was in the heart of God, which wasn't a box with some incense on it. No, I like incense. You know, I'm a God, I really dig this incense. Burn it, baby, all the time. I want it all the time. <laughs> You know, as if, I mean, that's just ridiculous. But we get more out of that than we do Ephesians talking about the descending and ascending and that process that is going to bring forth glory to God in the end because it is a process from a progression from altar to altar. So you never, you never leave the altar. And the same fire that burned up the lamb, welcome to all of us. He put it on Isaiah and he's going to put it on you. <laughs> so I'll read that again and then I'll read the next sentence with a big and in front of it. The fire that ascended at the altar of incense is the same fire that first descended on the brazen altar to burn up the sacrifice. And... The lamb that first was set afire for destruction is the same lamb that ascended to the glory of the Father. Same one. See, the, the key word in that last verse there in verse 10, he that descended is the same. He's the same one that got raised. He didn't change him. He only glorified him. All right. In these verses, we see that he rose as a sweet-smelling savor to God. And to him, God, he wants this given Jesus to fill all things. Isn't that what it says here? Yeah, la the very last phrase of Ephesians uh, 4.10, that he might fill all things. Do you see that? This is not, he's not just confining it to himself, okay? That he might fill all things. Mary of Bethany honored the given Jesus and the fragrance filled the room. She honored the given Jesus, the one that was going to die and be buried. And the fragrance filled the room. To her, his selflessness was the fragrance that filled her heart. Not, not her little jar, and you know, and everybody's going, ooh, the jar, oh my God, the stuff that she gave up for Jesus. What a woman. She she's, has none of that. This is a response to something already broken open in her heart of toward Jesus and the fragrance that he, that he would give himself. And she's honoring him in his death and burial and his selfless giving. So I wrote to her, his selflessness was the fragrance that filled her heart and probably expected to find, and probably she expected to find it already filled in the disciples' hearts. And she didn't find it there. But don't you know that she probably thought they have, they know, they know Jesus. They're bound to. 
had been with him a long time, you know. But see, she got a secret audience in there with Martha, and you know. She got a secret audience, even though there might have been disciples all around. It didn't mention that, but there probably were. And Martha's cooking, and she's sitting at his feet, and she's hearing something. And the scriptures don't even tell us. They only show her response. And she, I bet you anything, she fully expected this to already be in them and for them for them to just like go oh yes 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 to this one this lamb this spirit be all glory and let us break everything we got and pour it out instead they didn't understand the altar of incense they didn't understand that it was a real thing. They didn't understand that it was, you remember it says of that, it filled the, the, the place. It filled the place that he might fill all things. And to her, that fragrance was filling, she thought it was filling the place. It certainly was filling her. And then their response you know, well, we could have used this for the ministry. What a waste. And Jesus says, let her alone. Let her alone. She did this in relationship to my burial, which means my death and And I'm still waiting on the Lord to fully explain because I said to the Lord after he shared this with me, I said, well, you know, you know, he broke that for his burial. And when you buried somebody, you know, like Jesus, before they put him in the tomb, they come to bring the ointments and stuff for anybody because they would smell. Because in your death, in, if it's your death, you're going to smell and you need to be totally put away. Any fragrance of you violates the purity of Christ or, or of me. It violates. And, and I didn't get a full picture other than she, uh, she recognized the true fragrance and that he didn't need it because, number one, he wouldn't stink, and number two, he wouldn't be in there long enough. Because God honors that. What this first ascended, ascended far above all powers and principalities and might, that he might fill all things. Altar of incense. Father, we just ask you to to open our eyes to Jesus and to join with him, to, to joyfully join with him and to do so by the, the beauty of the spirit who also will never defile a thing. He, he remains hidden, invisible. He, he does not speak of himself. He only lifts you up, Jesus. What a pure vessel to come to us and declare you. May we not be as the disciples and totally miss a, an eternal moment, a precious moment. But may we be as Mary of Bethany, just doing what's in our heart, just going for it for you, Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're dismissed.